the Indianapolis 500. It's almost like a religious experience for a lot of people. This is the Marmon Wash, which won the very first Indianapolis 500 in 1911. This car matters because it is the first winner of this iconic race, which is now about to be held for the 100th time. There's so much tradition here, and thankfully, the car that won the original is not only preserved, it's documented throughout its life and 100% authentic. How many other situations are there like that where they didn't think 20 years ago, let's create one, this is it. <laughs> At the time that the Indianapolis Speedway was built, open roads were not paved in the state of Indiana, and automobiles were now capable of greater speeds than the roads could provide. So one of the reasons that the track was built was as a proving ground for the industry. They said, we need somewhere where we can just run the cars to their extreme. And then also, it would be an opportunity to show the public how good their products were. The original surface, crushed rock and tar, proved to be a disaster. There were a number of accidents and some fatalities. So in the fall of 1909, bricks and mortar was put down. It was rough and it was bumpy, but it was much safer. So they had three-day meets of automobile races in the 1910 season and they didn't draw very well and they thought well this isn't working and they said well let's try something else so the thinking was let's put up a huge purse and run a special event that will start advertising right away it ended up that they decided to have a 500 mile race the 1911 500 i think it's very possible that that's the first time an automobile race had ever been scheduled for 500 miles that one was a huge success. On race day, they had about 80,000 people. There were train loads coming in from New York and St. Louis and Chicago. They hit a home run the first year. Marmon, I mean, they were turning out automobiles regularly. Originally, the company was in Richmond, Indiana, and they built flour milling equipment. It was a substantial company, and it was one of the more prestigious makes. Many of the drivers at that time were engineers and they were employed by the automobile companies as test drivers. There was no safety features at all and if there was any kind of accident, the riding mechanic would go flying through the air and possibly the driver as well. And then there's the heat, the engines are in the front and all of the heat is coming back. The suspensions were not that great. There was virtually no protection, so it was exceedingly dangerous, but nobody was making them do it. It required certainly physical strength and intestinal fortitude. <laughs> I was very blessed that I had the opportunity to sit with Ray Haroon, the winner of the 1911 500 on several occasions in his kitchen. I described him as professorish. There's a photograph in the archives with him sitting in a monoplane which he built. He said, I never thought of myself as a driver. I was an environment engineer. He said, I told them I quit at the end of the 1910 season. And he said, look, I, 200 miles is enough. You know, 500, I don't want to run that far. So I talked him into it. But he said, I didn't win the 1911 500. Marmon won the 1911 500. I just happened to be the driver. The Wasp was not a stripped down passenger car. That was a racing vehicle that the Marmon engineers had built. The thinking was, there's no rule to specify that we have to carry a riding mechanic. So if we build a single seater, we can save the weight of a second person and then build a more narrow and streamlined body. In 1911, Marmon only built a four cylinder engine. This is a purpose built six cylinder race engine. It utilizes three two cylinder blocks it has full pressure oiling system, which is very unusual for back then. It may be as much as 60 to 70 horsepower. It's a crank start, so if it was to stall on a pit stop, it would take a fairly hardy sole to crank it. It became known as the Wasp because the shape of the tail, the original nickname was the Yellow Jacket. Then it got shortened to wash. I've got a little bit of goosebumps right now when I'm thinking about the fact that I can sit next to it and anybody can come and see it. Parnelly Jones drove this on the 100th anniversary of the first running. He climbed in and he sat there and his knees were up around his chin and he turned to me and he says, 
how the hell did he drive this thing? <laughs> It was in 1911, uh, in practice for the 500, when there were concerns from some of the other teams about the fact that car's out there and it doesn't have the riding mechanic to keep appraised of, of who was coming up one side or the other. And so Ray Haroon remembered a horse-drawn taxi that he'd seen seven years before in Chicago. It had a pole with a mirror on it, and they said, okay, let's try that. So they put the four rods above the cowling with the mirror that was three by eight inches, and the theory that he would drive along and then be able to look up and see what was going on behind him. The job of the mechanic in those days was to watch behind and notify the driver when other cars were trying to pass. So I rigged up this little gadget and that silenced the critics. He said, I was given credit for inventing the rear view mirror. Well, of course I didn't, but it is believed to be the first time that it was ever done on an automobile. And when I asked him how it worked, he said, well, to tell you the truth, it shook so badly, I couldn't see a damn thing in it anyway. In those days, people were blowing tires, and they didn't have detachable wheels. You actually changed the tire. So during practice in 1910, he said, we did an experiment. And I found that while we were capable of running over 80 miles an hour, if we ran 75, we could double the tire wear. So when we went into the 500, our strategy was, we're going to run 75 miles an hour. We don't care what anybody else is doing. And if they want to go by me and blow a tire, that's up to them. The newspaper the next day reports that Ray Haroon changed four tires and stopped four times. They didn't blow any tires. Ralph Mulford, who finished second, changed 14 tires. It was a very methodical approach that worked. The result was that in the minds of the public, Marmon won the Indianapolis 500, let's get one. And so their sales increased so rapidly that they very quickly decided, let's disband our racing team, let's quit while we're ahead. Today is the 100th running of the Indy 500. To be here is, is just the most thrilling thing. It's probably the most historic event I'll ever go to in my entire life. The Indianapolis 500 survived two world wars, and even during the Depression, people still came. It was the same event held at the same facility on approximately the same day every year. That's the secret, I think. You grew up with it. And if somebody says, this is my 42nd race or my 38th race, that's almost everybody you run into. People that want to tell you their story, and it may be about where they sit or some little tradition of this, and they've got tears in their eyes when they're telling you about it, and that is not unusual, that is very, very common. There's just this emotional connection with the past. I'm Donald Davidson, and this car matters.